the biggest concern that I have for people is their their desire to run right back to what they learned wasn't totally efficient. The title industry is often called a hidden industry. So pinpointing the value and selling your title policies effectively can be challenging. While many industries struggled during the COVID-19 pandemic, the title and real estate industry was bolstered by strong home buyer demand. Selling title orders might not have been the same challenge it's been in the past, but how you engaged with your current clients and prospects likely took a dramatic turn. In my interview with Daryl Turner, a leader in title sales coaching, he doesn't pull any punches about the hard truths title company owners and sales teams are facing in a rapidly changing industry. Find out if your company is breaking bad habits, engaging with prospects in a 21st century way, and focusing on the right metrics and strategies to sell title. I'm Amanda Farrell, and this is Title Talks. Well, thank you so much for joining me and for, you know, taking the time to talk a little bit about selling title policies and being a salesperson within the title industry. I haven't really seen, you know, too many people talk about these strategies except for you. And so I'm really excited to, you know, have you on the podcast and dive a little bit deeper into some of these ideas and questions that people might have around, you know, around sales. Um, Before I dive into the questions, can you go ahead and just give an introduction and a brief description of your your history in the title industry and in sales? Oh, yeah, certainly. Uh, Well, my name, obviously, Daryl Turner, and I have been doing this for 20, this is my 27th year. Uh, We've worked with about 1,100 title companies and almost 10,000 people in the business over that uh, period of time. I started on the West Coast in California and our company by 1997, I believe, was pretty much uh, nationwide. We specifically help sales organizations uh, inside the title industry. That's our home space. That's our homeland. The title business is our homeland. Uh, help on the sales side. The We coach a number of closers, escrow officers, settlement agents, whatever that part of the country calls them. I also coach a number of uh, top executives and owners within the industry as well, all on business expansion, leadership, and then on the sales side, obviously sales structure, process, measurement, pretty much everything that's involved to help people get to their next level. You know, during your career as a title sales training expert, what's one of the biggest changes that you've seen in the industry over, you know, this period of time that you've been in it? Well, I think the, the biggest change has happened in the last 15 months, um, which realistically were already coming. We already were uh, working on some of the strategies. A lot has changed. And at the same time, nothing has changed or very little has changed for some people. Uh, the industry is plagued with trying to hold on to the old ways, right? Trying to make sure that that everything that used to work we still want to do the the whining and dining and all of the things that salespeople predominantly did in the business. You know, a lot of people want to hold on to that. And then the newer people come in, the newer salespeople come into the organizations and they are the, they are the first to look for process. They are the first to look for sales efficiency. They tend to uh, grab onto the future. And so those, some of those newer people, they, you know, they don't have uh, things that they have to be untrained around. Uh, everything is new for them and they'll grab right onto it. But realistically, when we first started our organization in 1994, we referred to what we brought to the table as Title Sales 2.0. The Title Sales 1.0 was relationships, desk calendars, and expense accounts. Everybody's out trying to make friends, trying to take people to dinner, trying to go golfing. And when I say that, you know, for some people, nothing's changed. There's a lot of people that, that still think that is their sales process. And it's not a sales process that may be some good things to do for some of your existing clients and maybe some of your prospecting efforts can be based around that. But, you know, golfing is not a process of sales. It's, it's a component of, of human engagement. So we came along, we, we called that title sales 1.0 in 1994, about 2.0. Uh, about four years ago, we started introducing 3.0, which was how to work using the phone instead of in person. And we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more in one of your uh, other questions that you have. But so for many of the people we work with, COVID didn't change much of what they were doing. In fact, it it accelerated their ability to produce because they were already doing it and they were competing against people that didn't really have that same philosophy. So 
Uh, realistically, the, the biggest change is watching uh, various people accept the fact that this isn't 1995. This isn't 2006. We're beginning to enter the future of sales in the title business, I believe. Yeah, I think there are a lot of rapid changes happening, obviously, both um, in terms of sales, if that's your primary function, operations as well. There's just so much new technology being introduced uh, at every facet of the real estate transaction. It's really exciting and can also feel very overwhelming. There is something I did want to ask you about, you know, something you said, new people coming in and the training. And I'm, I'm curious to know if there's any sort of bad habits that you see that are constantly being, you know, maybe passed down um, and how you might suggest people breaking those. And I'm also curious too about, you know, people's main function being sales versus people who are also maybe doing some of the title work and also expected to do sales as well on a certain level. So maybe first let's kind of talk about about like bad habits that you see and how people can break them, especially now in today's age of selling through, you know, the phone on technology and things like that. From a bad, from a bad habit standpoint, uh, I think we could spend the rest of our hour talking about that. Uh, and it's all because we all have habits, right? Our habits are what we what we do in a repetitive fashion to the point that it becomes subconscious. That's what a habit is. And so uh, you know, prior to any real structure, yeah, there are a lot of bad habits. Uh, first, first bad habit is thinking that uh, customer service is sales. Uh, second one is thinking customer retention is sales. Sales is the acquisition of new sources of business, right? So when when somebody makes a sale, they're bringing on a new customer. So if you're if if it's a title agency that their primary focus is residential resale business and then their new customer would likely be a real estate agent, right? Or if they're focused on refi, their, um, you know, their new customer is going to be a, a loan originator or maybe a team or heck, a whole mortgage um, operation. You know, could possibly be that new source of business. All play to uh, play a very important role together. Customer service supports sales and supports retention, but retention and sales are two entirely different things. Retention is making sure that we're doing what we need to do to continually add value to the existing customer base while sales is seeking the opportunity to increase the size of our active customer base, right? So they're completely different. And some of the, some of the bad habits really, I mean, they, they, they're really around the misunderstanding of what those three entities or those three things do. And it, it, it's a difficult job at times to help a seasoned sales representative or an owner or a hybrid, which is what you described a few minutes ago, somebody that has multiple roles on both sides of the fence, because there's clearly a dividing line um, in personality traits between someone that does closings and someone that does sales or particularly someone from the from a title department, right, that has a responsibility in sales. But but the, I, I think the, the people that have been doing this for a while, the, the bad habits are, are, are always unintentional. And again, it's repetitive action to the point that it becomes subconscious. Um, and that's just, you know, I've answered this same question for a number of people. In fact, I, I got some emails today from a group that that was on a Zoom I did yesterday uh, talking about this this very thing. You know, they're, they're not, they, they didn't have an intention of falling in this trap, but, but the, the bad habit is that they are looking at taking care of existing customers as sales. And you know, that isn't the case. So yeah, there are some bad habits. And, and uh, I will tell you this too, from a standpoint of the beginning of the process of correcting the bad habits, it's a little saying we have in the organization, sometimes you need to stop to start, uh, or you at least need to slow down to speed up, right? So you have to take a look at these, these things that that maybe are in your blind spot that someone like myself or one of our coaches can help point out for someone that and a blind spot, by the way, means it's a blind spot. <laughs> they do not know they have it. Okay. And so it takes another set of eyes and we're able to point these things out. And if someone is willing and they're receptive and they're open and vulnerable, uh, because those are all required ingredients for the next level of success for any person. But if they possess those, then they'll pay attention to, to when someone points out what that blind spot is. And most people that have been in the business a really long time, they just don't realize that th their primary role, if they're in sales, if they have the word sales in their title, first of all, if they have the word marketing in their title, they need to change it to sales unless they're actually 
in the marketing department and they have a degree in marketing because most people call themselves marketing reps, don't know anything about marketing. That's just a name for a sales rep that takes the focus off of actually selling. I probably just stepped on a lot of toes right there, but that's okay. If they're in a sales role at all, they need to accept the fact that their primary responsibility is the development of additional sources of business and making sure that they take those new sources of business through the transitional period, three to first three to five transactions. And our study showed that it takes three to five uh, transactions for that new customer to relationally gel with processors or closers or escrow officers on the inside. And that's where salespeople are uh, also needed to play that role of getting them past that fifth deal. But at that point, here's the hard part for a salesperson, which is uh, a bad habit for many people. Uh, on the other side of the scale is that they do not properly disengage uh, to the degree that they should after the fifth deal. So they get to a point where they're also managing that retention responsibility along with the closer. And they get to the point that they've convinced themselves they no longer have time to prospect and sell and add to the customer base. So there's a healthy balance in that. I think I just threw out there about four or five bad habits, didn't I? You, yeah, you threw out a lot of information. I think all of it was super valuable and helpful. I, I love the point you made about you know, with someone like yourself, a consultant coming in, providing that extra value of a realistic observation to sort of help you understand where your blind spots are, where some of your shortcomings are. And if you're willing to acknowledge that, address it and create those new processes to really, you know, deal with that, it'll definitely help you. And the whole thing about the role of marketing versus sales and also customer uh, service or client success or whatever you want to want to call it, but just how those three departments or those three roles, they have a lot of overlapping effect on each other. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't really realize. And like you're saying, when it's time to let go as a salesperson and have that handoff for your your people who are maybe more related to the maintenance of the relationship. Um, and understanding where those roles lie, it's super important. And so much I know has changed in marketing as well over the past decade or so with the introduction of inbound marketing and content writing, which is something that you know I'm heavily focused on and using that education to really draw people in and warm up those leads to pass them off to your sales team and really like making sure you guys are gelling together in a way that will produce success. So yeah, lots of ideas. I, I loved everything that you were saying there. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, so yeah, on that note too, you, you also mentioned um, how things can get so busy and taking a step back to actually slow down and kind of reconsider what your processes are and how you might be able to improve them. You know, I was thinking how much um, the industry right now, the title industry is expect or is experiencing all of these surges and title orders and everyone is so busy right now. So what were what would be some tips that you would give to title companies in order to help them focus on selling more and maybe focusing on the most important parts right now in order to grow their actual uh their sales versus, you know, maybe getting distracted by the retention part. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. And, and I think that your listeners are going to appreciate that a lot because I think every, just about every title agency in the country is facing what you're talking about right now. They're, they're so busy. Uh, the market is, you know, there's, there's two markets that we're in and they both have the same saying. It's, you know, back in 08, everybody was saying, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And today they're saying, oh, my gosh, this is crazy, right? I mean, it's the same words and entirely different uh, meaning. The one, the one thing that we have to keep in mind is that hot markets ruin good salespeople. Uh, hot markets ruin good business people. In other words, they, they get so busy with the business that they forget about the things that are core critical to advancing their business, right? And I think that... Um, in this particular market, one, one of the things that's really important is that if you're in sales, you keep selling. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's easy to be caught up in the wrong measurables. And, and so let, let's talk, let's talk about how that happens a little bit be, and because it's really happening right now across the country. And let's talk about first the organization that, that has salespeople. 
Okay, because there's really two kinds of title agents out there, those who um, have identified salespeople and those who have unidentified salespeople because they still need to build their business. They just don't know that's part of their job. Right. But the, the, the organizations with identified salespeople, um, they look at the wrong measurables. They, they look at uh, the total, not the total order count, for example. Uh, you know, if, if if somebody said, hey, I have X number of orders this month. It does not tell me anything about their sales ability, right? Uh, if they say uh, our revenue is X and it's a record, you know, I remember uh, last July, I think was the first time every client we work with said, we're setting records this month. I believe that was the first month that 100% of them said it. And you have to think about it. If 100% of the companies are setting records, that means it's market driven because the, the true uh, growth, the, the organic growth of a, of a title agency is all based on customer acquisition. So if you're setting records on customer acquisition, that means other title companies lost a customer, right? I mean, think about it. And so if everybody sets a revenue record, then we have to back up and say, uh, that's market contribution. And so th from look, from what the measurables are, uh, we have a lot of salespeople that want to constantly tell us all their orders they have and what their revenue is. And and ultimately we take it back to the, the indicator of a good salesperson is are you generating customers you didn't have? And, and how many orders do you have per month that are than the first five transactions from newly converted customers that you generated? That's the focus. That's the metric. That's the only way to know how a company is going to come out of this. Okay, for example, when the refis slow down because they're going to, let's say that that is 20%, 25% of an organization's revenue, right? Uh, the only true way to prepare for that is to focus right now on growing your customer base by 25%. A 25% reduction in market is offset by a 25% increase in your customer base. And it may not be exact math because one's going up, one's coming down, but it's going to be close. And that's where they miss it. They're so busy right now that um, th these, if we're not careful, too many people are going to be caught off guard. But none of them have permission to be caught off guard because... We've been talking about this as an industry now, right, for well over a year. I mean, when COVID first hit, um, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Mike Ferry, good friend, national real estate coach and trainer. We did a Zoom and we talked about the prediction of what was going to happen in the second half of, of uh, 2020 from a real estate perspective. And back in, in March, April, maybe May, I think we did our interview in April, uh, you know, we weren't sure if the sky was falling. And if it was falling, we weren't sure if it was going to land right on us or right next to us. But but there was a lot of concern in the business. And we predicted the uh, second half of the year almost spot on. And that doesn't mean that we're economists. It means that we were mostly lucky, right, in the way that we made the prediction. But there was pent-up demand. Interest rates were good. We, we knew some things that were going to happen. But what all, all of the companies are faced with right now is – is the necessity to back up off the market and look at their business plan, look at their business model, look at their sales structure and ask themselves, are we adding customers at a healthy enough rate that when the market stabilizes or regains its normal, will we be as profitable as we want to be? Uh, because usually what happens is the market slows down and people panic, right? And then they look at their sales team and they say, what have you not been doing? <laughs> and so, so and let's talk about the same thing on the, on the hybrid side. If a company doesn't have salespeople, the principles are the same, but a little more difficult because the people who are then responsible to keep the customer base growing are also the ones that are overwhelmed right now with more volume than they can you know, possibly get their arms around. And so at, at the end of the day, the same need is present. Slow down so you can speed up. Stop so you can start. Back up a little bit and look at what's happening and ask yourself, what are the three most important things I can do right now or start doing right now to more, to more um, strongly stabilize our organization for the new, new normal that's coming? <laughs> that's what we're going to call it, the new, new normal. Uh, hopefully, we don't end up with a third new and new normal, but um, that's what companies need to be doing. And those are you know, that should, should be their focus. And I think I'll, I'll close with this one with the same thing I said to open it. Hot markets ruin good salespeople. Don't let that happen. If you're listening right now, do not let that happen to you. Step back and ask yourself that question. What three things do I need to be doing right now to prepare for a stronger tomorrow? 
Yeah, I the whole new normal, new new normal, getting back to normalcy. I don't know. Uh, everything's it's definitely changed, and we're not going back. But um, but yeah. So I'm I'm curious then too about you know for new sales reps in the industry, what are some of the most important tips that you would give? We talked a little bit about bad habits. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the good habits. Yeah, yeah. Um, math. Think about think about the math uh, involved in all of this. And and what I'm about to share with you, some people are you know they're going to want to challenge uh, me. Actually, I'm on your podcast, so I'll let them challenge you. But um, <laughs> they're they're going to want to challenge some of these numbers. But we we've run a lot of, of uh, math tests, I guess, uh, over the years. And one of the things we've determined is that from an outside sales perspective. Um, it's on average 125 to 140 dollars for a salesperson to walk into a real estate office, right? But here's the real problem: is connectivity inside that office. Pre-COVID, it was only at its highest 19 19 percent connectivity rate, which means 19 out of 100 real estate offices that a sales rep walked into, they could actually engage a conversation with someone that made it worth their time, right? So that means 81 percent of the time there was nobody there. It was already fragmented. They were already working at Starbucks. But if you so if you do the math, take the cost, let's just use 140, uh, and you divide that by 19%, means a, a healthy sales conversation costs a title company $736. There's no way to make that pay, right? Not when it takes five to 12 conversations to stand the chance to convert a customer. Start doing the math. You're at a negative very, very quickly. But using the telephone, if you're, you know, if, if, if new people are listening right now, or organizations have new salespeople that are listening right now, using the telephone to engage people that are in files, particularly on the other side of files. Um, a healthy sales conversation costs $36. It's 2,044% better in efficiency, right? And, and the other statement is very clear. You, you can't drive as fast as you can dial. So, you know, the, let's talk, let's, let me throw the, the comment that I made a little while ago back in, the future of the industry. The future of the industry is going to be, I believe, it's going to be more enterprise sales. Uh, I, I believe that it's going to be uh, inside sales structure more than outside sales structure. And I know there's going to be a lot of outside salespeople listening to this right now. They're going to, you know, start prank calling me on my phone here soon, but the, it doesn't mean that they can't be effective. It just means that the efficiencies aren't going to be there any longer. And with realtors and lenders already working remote, it's going to be a, a pretty significant amount of time before the masses move back into an office space that makes person to person selling uh, even as efficient as it was pre COVID, which wasn't very efficient. And so I think the future is, is more of an inside enterprise team, more using the phones, definitely following a sales process. And I know, you know, we have one, right? Uh, definitely following a sales process and, and not um, winging it based on personality. You know, pro process and personality are two different ways to approach sales. And personality is the traditional way and process is the future. And I think, you know, you put all that together with the efficiency of using the phone versus as much in person. Um, I, I think that, you know, if I was a new sales rep, what would I want somebody to tell me? I'd want them to tell me all the things we're talking about right now. You know, I don't know when it'll happen, but I think the movement towards, you know, more inbound versus outbound marketing and sales, you know, you talk about people working remotely. We don't know how many people are going to be getting back into the office. I've had conversations with a lot of entrepreneurial title company owners who quite frankly that's never even going to be a part of their structure like they will have the majority of their employees always working remotely because that has been working for them and it's something that is very attractive to especially a younger working force and so if you want to continue to grow your title company in the current market you're definitely going to have to have a more future forward thinking kind of perspective and approach. And that's, I think, going to affect other industries as well, especially the real estate agents that you work with, with the mortgage companies that you work with and the investors, especially if you're using, you know, if, if you're making those connections with people who are buying a lot of real estate and using your title services. 
and the end consumer as well. You know, I had a conversation with two women who are on the HOP program at Alta and having more conversations with consumers as well. And so I think the overall market is really changing in general. And that means that your sales approach is obviously going to have to change as well. And you talked about people who are driving out to offices. I'm curious how common that was before COVID-19, because I'm actually surprised that that was such a huge priority, or it seems like it was a really big priority. And I, I'm curious because it seems like I would assume more people were already making phone calls before, but I guess that, that wasn't the case. Uh, no, actually, it's it's a great topic because keep in mind, there's two kinds of salespeople that are out there in the title business. Those who are relatively new, who totally understand the efficiencies of using technology, and then the rest who have been very relational, very interactive. And so, you know, when this when COVID first hit, these are the individuals saying, how long until we get back to normal? And what we really need to hear them ask is how long before I can become totally inefficient again? Because that's really what that random selling is. And everybody listening right now, they're all going to feel the same way. Like, I have a process. I have a way of doing things. I'm not, you know, I'm not random in who I'm calling on. And yet, to some degree, they're all going to be right. But largely enough, windshield time is the greatest time factor that a title sales representative faced pre-COVID. More of their time was windshield time than any other single thing they did throughout the course of the day. Uh, and that was you know, traveling around. And so you look, at, you look at drive time, you look at cost of drive time, you look at the possibility of an engagement being 19%. Then you look at getting back in your car and driving to the next. You know, a lot of people had a, had a routine. You know, they went to World Bank because it was Tuesday. Uh, they, you know, they went to Keller Williams because it was Wednesday. And, and there are some people that have broken away from that. But if the day of the week shows up in your call objective, then you already have an issue, right? Because you're going for the wrong reason. But yeah, it was, it was relatively common uh, pre-COVID. And there are people right now that are chomping at the bit to get back to that. And uh, we, you know, I, I, did a, I did a Zoom um, yesterday. I think it was yesterday or maybe uh, Thursday or Friday of last week. And I said, you know, the biggest concern that I have for people is their, their desire to run right back to what they learned wasn't totally efficient because of the social aspect of this business. Most of the people that are in sales for title companies right now are social people. And they were not, they, they, didn't, they didn't come into a job because of its protocols of sales structure. They came into it because they get to hang out with people. And it's the most common thing they say, I really like people. Um, and so that social aspect tends to want to drive them back to some of those things that were happening. So, I mean, honestly, it's a, it's a really great question and a really strong point to make. Yeah, I'm sure your comment about getting back to normal is getting back to being inefficient is going to probably be a bit of a burn for a lot of people. But I, I do think that it is a, it's an astute observation and it is accurate. And, you know, just like getting back to normal, whatever your normal life was, you know, regardless of what your profession was, things are not going to be getting back to normal. You just have to keep moving forward. If you're not moving forward, you're not growing. And if you're not growing, you're dying. Right. So yeah, that's something really important to keep in mind that things have changed and we're not going back. Well, and there's, there's a large number of people that are out there that uh, they were, you know, the social aspect uh, drove them. But th th that doesn't mean they weren't totally inefficient. I mean, there's, they, they do, they, but, uh, but I'm telling you, I mean, I will stand by this statement because, you know, we've, we just the, just the sales rep side of our coaching and training business, we're, we're almost at 6,500 salespeople in the title business. So I, I, I can tell you a little bit about how they think and how they, how they tick, but some of them may have some really good efficiencies and they're not going to go fully back. Like take us, for example. Uh, you know, I pre COVID and you know this because you've seen a lot of this, but I would do a hundred to 125 live events a year around the country. And then COVID hit, I never slept in my own bed so many nights in a row in my life. And, um, took our first trip out, I think two months ago, do a live event in Florida, your neck of the woods. And, and, uh, and it, you know, it felt really good to do it, but we're, even though I, even though we want to get back out there and we're going to get back out there. 
we're going to get back out there with the knowledge, the new game knowledge from COVID. Like, how much are we going to do that? I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to get back to the point that I'm leaving every Tuesday or Wednesday to Friday night and every single week. Uh, that, that was, that was uh, what I thought I had to do, but now I learned I don't. And um, so I think what we need to do is evaluate what is the best that what is the what are the best things that we can do for a more efficient future as we move forward? It will involve some of the old ways. It will, uh, but it will not involve all of the old ways. And I guess that's what I'm really talking about. The people that are chomping at the bit to go entirely back to the way it was, they're, they're you know that that scares me for them the most. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I mean, there's definitely something very valuable in a tangible in-person event, getting to see someone face to face. But like you said, it's not necessarily something that you need to do in order to get your business done. And so I think it's going to be more about understanding, you know, when is an idea for an event or getting together in person? When is it going to be really valuable for the people that I am, you know, trying to increase my sales with? What's what's the goal that I have in mind? And is it worth it for them and you know thinking in that way for everything that you're doing um whether it's creating an in-person event going to a trade show getting in your car and visiting someone's office you you have to make those strategic decisions of when does it make sense to actually do this and making sure that it's still something of value and interest uh for that person that you are engaging with yes october october 20th and the 21st are the dates when people should go to their next event. It's Title Sales Mastery 2021, a Daryl Turner live event right now in Nevada. I just thought I'd throw that little plug in there. That's a great, <laughs> great plug. I love it. <laughs> um, so in our, our State of the Title Industry Report that PropLogix releases, we found that a lot of our clients are wearing many hats, including selling title orders. And so I wanted to, to see what you would say, what are some suggestions that you would give to these busy title professionals to balance those workloads? So th th that's a really good question. Now, when you say that, are you referring to, to the sales person side of the business or are you referring to more of the closer side of the business that also wears another hat of having to be responsible to build their own desk? The, the closers, so people who are actually doing title work. And yeah. so I will say probably a good majority of our clients are still in that small to mid title yes. company range. Yes. And so they don't necessarily have a full sales department or maybe they have one or a couple of sales reps, but they can't, you know, do all of the work themselves. And so they're doing a lot of different things, including making sure that they are either, and perhaps they might be, and this is something that we might wanna be adding to our survey next year, they might be confusing retention for sales too. So that's okay. something that I hadn't really thought about until you brought that up actually, but they do mention sales as part of their role. Yes, um, and they are typically or commonly gonna be confusing retention with, with sales or acquisition. But I, I think that, Amanda, no matter what, I say right now, uh, which I do have something I'll share with you, but no matter what I say right now, there's going to be a certain degree of the feeling of impossible that people are going to have because of how busy they are. Mo most of them are not at capacity. They're, they're, or many of them are not at capacity. They're beyond capacity, right? They're stretched already. And so one of, one of the simple things to do is if, if I said, well, gosh, you need to, you need to time block for your sales efforts. Uh, you know, normally, and that's a great idea. You should. Uh, in this day and age right now, with as busy as everybody is, if they time block, they're, they're still going to overlap their other activities on top of that time block. They're, it's not going to be, doesn't, you know, putting it on your calendar doesn't mean that it's possible or probable. It means you have a reminder to try. Okay. Uh, but I, I, here's what I'll tell everybody in regard to this. What what can they do to, to wear those hats and balance? Let's, let's look at Let's just look at sales and retention, okay? The most common time a, a closer calls a customer in a file is when there's a problem, right? Which means if I'm a real estate agent and I get a call from a title agent that I'm in a transaction with, and I, I have a missed call and a voicemail, and I haven't even heard the voicemail yet, I guarantee you I have anxiety, worry, and concern before I listen to my voicemail because I've been trained by the industry that the only time you're going to call me is when something's wrong. OK, so the first thing that I'll tell people that are wearing so many hats and so overloaded right now is begin to rethink that. 
when you have a file that's not in bad shape, call the customer and let them know, hey, I'm working on your file and I just wanted to let you know that everything's looking good. Closing date, closing date hasn't changed, not dealing with any issues. And frankly, um, I wanted to call you and tell you that because if I was you, uh, I'd, I'd want to know that. Thanks for the business. That's on the retention side. Now let's look at how to add a sales element to this with only one more phone call. How about the agent that didn't direct? Their expectations of that closer are so low uh, because they don't work with that individual. They're not expecting anything from them because they're not the directing entity. If they receive the very same sales call, very same uh, phone call from that closer, that the file's in good shape, thanks for the business. If I were you, I'd want to know. We appreciate you. That's called customer surprise, right? And service is what people expect. Surprise is what people remember. And so if you want to be effective in retention and acquisition or sales or whatever we want to call it, we have to have what we call customer surprise, the element of catching people off guard in a positive way, giving them an experience that they would want to to, uh, relive that experience again after this transaction is over. So I think to keep it really simple, I think if my advice to, to people that don't have salespeople but are still responsible to fix the offset that's going to happen when refi slows down, right? Start looking at both sides of the file and, and, and ask yourself this question. How important would it be to this individual if I called them and told them everything was going well? How important would that be? And how long would it actually take? Because actually that's a voicemail that you could leave. In fact, let me just get uh, really modern on you. That's a text message you could leave if you had to. It is not an email. Too many people think, well, I'll just send him an email, let him know everything's okay. It is not an email. Email becomes an effective form of communication when relationship is established, but not prior. So if you didn't know me and never heard my name and I sent you an email, you'd probably delete it. But I know if I sent you an email yesterday because we know each other, you would have read it, right? So a person on a file on the non-directing side, even though, oh, that's a company that I'm interacting with, uh, an email is a very objective form of notification more than a form of communication. And so we tell people just don't don't go that path. Either call, leave a voicemail, or send them a text message. But and the thing about text messages is when you get a text, you're, if your phone is anywhere near, it lights up, right? What do you do? You look at it. Sometimes pick it up. So if you really want to call somebody on the other side of a deal, text them. Tell them you're going to call them. Five seconds later, call them. Guess what they're holding in their hand? <laughs> their phone, right? So now I think we could go, we could elaborate on this all day long, but I think from a from an effectiveness standpoint, as busy as people are, if they just focused on that aspect of managing the positive elements of surprise throughout the course of the file, and they did not look as at their prospect as being external to their file. They just look at their file. Let's look at it this way. It's, it's retention and hyper-retention. Sales is hyper-retention. They're already your customer, whether they picked you or not. You don't have to like shopping at Walmart to be called a customer if you're caught inside, okay? And, and so anybody, that, anybody that's on the other side of a deal, if you do not treat them as a customer that you want to keep, you're missing your greatest sales opportunity that there is. And, and really, people that are super busy right now, they just focused on those two sides. We haven't even talked about the lender. They place the same call to the lender, and now they're really after it, right? But I think as busy as people are, if you don't have a salesperson, that's where I would start. I would I would work on mastering that, calling when nothing's wrong. And I know that that sounds – I had a lady one time say to me after a meeting, she was an escrow manager in California. She came up and she said, I'm going to try that thing you say. And I go, what thing? I didn't even know what part she meant. I spoke for like five hours that day. She goes, you know, call, calling for no reason. And I said – what do you mean no reason? She goes, well, they're calling them for no reason. And I said, Who, whoever taught you that good news isn't the best reason to call? And if nothing's wrong, you have good news. But that's the industry. So I know people are listening right now thinking, that's exactly right. I mean, we don't call when things are right. We only call when things are bad. Well, guess what? You're also competing with people who only call when things are bad. So all you have to start doing is calling when things are good, and you've created the element of positive customer surprise. Yeah, and I can say as someone who keeps an eye on our email marketing metrics, I can definitely attest to the fact that you're going to get much higher engagement with someone that you've already established a relationship with. So right. yeah, take it from me. <laughs> it definitely helps. No catchy sub subject line in the world will get that person to open their email if they don't know 
who Amanda from Prop Logics is. So but, you know, we still do it. I mean, we still we still have email. I, I think my organization sent out ten thousand emails today for our event coming up in October, probably. So many of the listeners will know exactly what they recorded this, right? Um, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do that kind of stuff. But when we're really looking at reaching a specifically targeted individual that's in a file that we really want to impress to the point to cause them to want to come back, email is just not the right approach. And I was curious, um, I was reading this article actually about um, from the sales rep who is in title industry. And he made the comment about how there isn't a whole lot of distinction between title policies uh, because most title policies are written by the big four companies nowadays, typically, there isn't a huge difference in the quality of the product. So how can sales reps like position their services as different or better from the competition? Uh, well, what a great question. Let me let me risk upsetting people here. I mean, oh gosh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, Amanda. I'm going to risk it. Uh, title insurance is not the sexiest product in the world. Okay. And uh, only in the commercial side, to customers care much about who issues the final policy, okay? On the residential side, they really don't even know who the possible issuers could be, right? So there's there's not a lot of comparison. On, at the end of the day, uh, there is no real difference. So, so the attraction in our business is not based on who the underwriter is or whose policy is it at the end of the day. It's based on how you and I make decisions. Amanda, if you if you went to a restaurant with your friend and you had a horrible experience, you would be upset and that's your emotion. And while you're walking to the car, you would say to them, I'm not going to come back here again. And there's your decision. That's how we operate as human beings. Experience releases, releases or creates emotion. Emotion is the root of decision. You know, two two thirds of our decisions are are emotion. One third need to be supported with logic. If we make a three thirds emotional decision, that's going to create buyer's remorse. You know, like that big flat screen you bought two years ago or whatever. That you woke up the next day and like, why did I do that? Right? What's well, three thirds emotion? But um, or maybe maybe for you it's a truckload of shoes. I don't know. Maybe for me it was a flat screen. But the, the we have to consider that people go back to title companies. People make decision to use certain organizations uh, based on emotions and the experiences that they have create those emotions. So let's go back to what we were talking about a minute ago, contacting that agent on the other side of a transaction. It's all about the experience. That's so that hybrid can sell and retain at the same time based on the same file. Right. So I think if you're, if you're looking at selling, title insurance and you're you're a title agency that focuses primarily on residential resale uh good luck because it's not sexy right but if you <laughs> did you think i just made everybody mad right there probably not um if you are truly working to generate customers for your agency you have to focus on the experiences that they're having because that's how we make decisions experience emotion decision right but here's the problem. Most people, and you're, you know, I don't know who wrote the article on that you're referring to. If you send it to me, I'd love to read it. But the uh, most salespeople in this business think their job is to get somebody to make a decision, and they work from the wrong end of the scope. If you make a decision, it'll trigger an emotion, and it'll be a great experience. That's how most people operate, which is completely backward than how people actually make decisions. So they're, they're, they're thinking their job is to get people to make that decision. Well, no, that's the end result you're looking for, right? And but, but how do you start? You have to focus on the experiences that they're having with you, and you'll have them. Everybody that's in a file with you right now is having an experience, and only typically in a purchase transaction, only one third of the parties in a file picked you. Two thirds of the parties in, the, in a typical residential resale transaction did not pick you. Therefore, they're neglected, but they're the ones also getting an experience. That's what makes them your best prospect, is because of this this flow of words I just gave you, experience, emotion, decision, they're your best prospect because they're currently getting experience. You have the opportunity to turn that experience into something positive that releases a positive emotion that causes that person to say, hey, I want to go back there again, just like the restaurant. If you were with a friend and you had a great experience at a restaurant, you would be happy and that's your emotion. And you would walk to your car and say, we need to come back here again. There's your decision. The title industry is no different. And here's the amazing thing. 
Very rarely does your experience in a restaurant have anything to do with food. It may start with food, but your experience is how they handle the situation maybe, right? It's almost all service related, but it's really service that you didn't expect, which means surprise, just like we were talking about a few minutes ago. So when you're, when you're looking at the title world, uh, title is like the food. It's not the decision element in most cases. It's everything that happens around it, right? So if two companies, because you could actually have, you know, two agencies in the same city issuing for the same underwriter, which makes everything the same, right? Except for the level of service that they provide to the customer, and their ability to create the right experience, to create the right emotion, to create the right decision. So then on that note, I'm wondering, you know, my follow-up question to that is what are some of the most important value propositions that real estate agents respond to and what about lenders? And so maybe it's not so much about the value proposition, but about the experience. What are some of the experiences that you need to make sure that each party is having in this transaction with you? It's a great question. And, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting. We talked a little bit about customer surprise a few minutes ago, right? We just talked about it in the last question. But, but ultimately, at the end of the day, you can make a list of all the things. If you're selling or you're a title agency owner, you can make a list of all the things that you would call items of value, um, which I don't like that term because I believe when we have something that we call an item of value, we, we fool ourselves into thinking it will sell for us. Okay, look at, look at all the items that you, somebody might call the item of value and call it is an item of repetitive engagement. If that item does not allow you to engage your prospect or customer in a repetitive fashion, then you're, you have an you have a too high of an expectation of what that item is going to do for you, and you're not going to be engaging or selling um, the best way that you can. So if you but but if you look at what people respond to, you if you made a list of all of those items, and then on the other side was on the other list was only one statement, a positive update on a current transaction. Okay. Tell me what in the world would they want off the first list that you have to give away that would mean more to them than a positive update of a current transaction. There's nothing. There's no desk calendar. There's no pen. There's no coffee cup. There's no There's no box of golf balls, right? There's no daiquiri. There's, I mean, there's nothing that, that they want more than this, but yet this first list is what people tend to operate off of. And I think what needs to happen is we need to realize what people really want um, from their title agency that they're, that they're currently working with. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, value is only that which exceeds your customer's expectation. Short of that, it's not a value, right? But the scope of your value is solely determined by the size of the problems that you solve for your customers, okay? So are, are we good at discovering what they're dealing with so that we can solve it? Because right now, realtors have a lot of issues they're dealing with. There's an inventory issue. Uh, that's not inventory is not the problem. It's an issue. The problem is somewhere along the way, the community uh, has changed in how they market. Uh, there's been a lower production level of new homes. There's a number of things that contribute to it. First time home buyers have nothing to sell, right? Investors aren't selling anything. People buying second homes right now are not selling anything. So we have a trade imbalance. At the same time, we have a, a, a downturn in production levels of new housing, those are the problems. The issue is we don't have enough listings, okay? So what what needs to happen in the marketplace is those, those realtors need to be going after the listings. Title companies need to be helping them solve that problem with whatever tools and strategies that they can, that they can offer up. But ultimately, most of the customers of the title agents do not have a business plan. That's why, that's why every deal is a panic. Because I mean, if if I mean, if you lost a hundred dollars out of your out of your purse, you'd be frustrated about that, right? But if you knew where the gold was buried, and you had a shovel and you had easy free access to that, you would certainly see the hundred dollars differently, right? You, it wouldn't panic you. Well, real estate agents are mostly panicked because they don't know where the gold's buried. They don't have a business plan, a process to follow, and and those are value propositions that they that they respond very well to. If a title agent will become more of an industry expert on the real estate business. You know, let, let me just say this and risk upsetting some realtors here. Um, if if a title agent wants to know more about real estate than the average real estate agent knows about real estate, all they need to really do is read one real estate book. And they'll have more to offer from a, from a value standpoint and a content standpoint than most of the people in the business already, you know, that what they know. So it's that to me, that's the 
That's the element. Think about this. Why are people listening to this podcast right now? It's because they're looking to build their business, right? Exactly the same model. So why would somebody listen to a title company? Well, can the title company help me build my business? It look, think of it as a bell curve. On the front side of the bell curve is the title agency's ability to help a prospect or customer with business strategy. On the back side of the bell curve is simply asking for the business that that person already obtained on their own. Well, the title company is going to be most attractive to that prospect is the one that can help on the front side of the bell curve. That's a business partnership, right? It doesn't have to be a RESPA violation, anything like that. It can be knowledge transfer, what I know that you should do. Those are the conversations that should be happening uh, in the marketplace. So those are some things that from what I've seen in my 27 years, the, the real estate community, the commercial real estate community, the lending community, they respond very well to that individual that can offer ideas, thoughts, and strategies to help that individual solve their business problems. Opportunities for them to grow will definitely provide those important and delightful or surprising experiences like you you mentioned before. I think that that's super important. And that's why we focus so much at PropLogix and our marketing team on creating really great content to start that conversation with the people in the industry and to also you know, whether they decide to use us or not, help them grow their business and succeed because it is a relationship driven business. And I, we do, you know, we have propositions and one of those is we're all in, the, we're all in this together. And so I think it's really important to not ever think about those initiatives that you take to educate your partners, to never think of those as you know, wasted time, or if it doesn't work right away, you know, if the, if the person doesn't become your client right away, that that's okay, because you're still there. And they'll remember you. And eventually, you probably will have that opportunity to work with them, because they will see the value that you bring is more than just issuing the policies. Right. Um, so I'm curious, also, we've talked about Real estate agents, we talked about lenders. Are there some unconventional prospects that you would suggest to sales reps that they go after that are often neglected in the industry? Uh, you mean short of probate attorneys and people like that that uh, know things that are going on or people that that, that uh, uh, engage um, estate management? Uh, yeah, there are. Uh, people that uh, uh, I was reading an article the other day on, on – uh, you know, they're on uh, the rate of divorce. It's tragic in this country, right? But there's a percentage of those of those individuals that are working with attorneys that know that there's property to be sold. And so, yeah, there are other um, unconventional prospects. But word of warning to those that are listening right now: uh, before you go for the untraditional, master your own backyard. Okay? Yeah, I can't tell you how many title agents called us uh, over the years, and they wanted to go national. We want to go national. And I said, okay, where are you? And they'll say, well, I'm in wherever area. What's your current market share? Oh gosh, it's like 4%. So you mean you have 4% of your backyard, but you'd like to go national. <laughs> okay. Now, I, my recommendation is get to 25% of your backyard and then let's talk again, right? So the most important prospects are not going to be the unconventional ones. They're going to be the people in your current files. That, that's where the future, easiest, simplest opportunity to grow comes from. However, I will tell you that some of those unconventional avenues that I just mentioned, you should make notes and begin to build an initiative around those. There's going to be a day and time in which it's going to make perfect sense to engage them. But but master your backyard before, and your backyard being your files. You know, If you've got people coming into files and going out of files uh, all day long, which most title agents do, just start closing the doors on some of those people, keeping them inside, right? And then when you really can master that, then ask yourself, how do I how do I best approach some of these unconventional markets? And so we we talked about customer experience. We talked a little bit about the technology that's been developing in the industry. And so I was curious to your thoughts on implementing tools that can help with the retention side, probably, and also maybe a little bit on the sales side in terms of being able to provide a more convenient experience for everyone that's working or part of a file. And so what do you think about, you know, these new customer service technology instruments that are being introduced that integrate with title software? Do you think that's something that agents who are busy should maybe look into? What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, first of all, I'm going to tell you our future will always include advancing technologies. 
always. I mean, let, let's let's be humorous here a little bit. You, you're you're not on MySpace, right? And some of so I see the look on your face right now. Uh, there, there's a lot I of people. actually I actually might still have it up, but I have not logged into it in probably a decade. Right, and then and then Facebook came along, and now I understand that's for old people, right? That's what. <laughs> yeah, it's all about TikTok now. Don't nod at me so quickly, Amanda, when I say it's for all people. Well, are you on TikTok? Because that's where all the cool kids are now. So. Well, you know, apparently I'm on Clubhouse. I'm on Clubhouse and uh, I use Clubhouse a little bit. And TikTok is where the cool kids hang out. And I think I made a deal with all my kids to not go there. They, <laughs> I, I believe all, most, if not all of them, have said that, please don't show up on TikTok. But so here, here's really the thing to think about. When any, anytime there's a new technology that's released, there's three groups of people, right? Those who absolutely hate the idea of anything changing. Uh, those who are kind of neutral, show me the way, show me how to make it work best for me. And then the group's like, this is incredible. This is exactly what we need. It, it also, and, and you know, I'll, 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 I'll broach the, the veil here and say, you can almost always categorize those three groups on age groups as well. It's uh, what people are most comfortable with. So there's a, there's a group of people that, you know, I heard somebody say the other day that that um, somebody said I, I tried to call you and they said, well, we're in the book. And, you know, and, you know, the phone book, the old thing that people used to use to put under their baby in a high chair because it would lift them up. You know, phone book. I don't even have a phone book. I don't even know where if you can even get a phone book anymore. But yet that comment was, well, we're we're in the book. Right. And um, and that's just, you know, that's normal. But I think no matter what we do, I, you know, you get, get in a new car today. Get, get in a car. I mean, we have we have CarPlay. CarPlay, what is that? It takes my entire iPhone, turns into an iPad on my dash. I mean, it's like, it, this is perfect, but that's new technology, right? And so I, I think that no matter what we do, whether we like it or not, it, advancing technology is going to be part of our future. And there'll be a day that AI is totally normal in our business, that it won't be an advantage to have it. It'll just be a disadvantage not to. You know, on the on the title side, even on the technical side, there'll be a day that that'll that'll be the norm. Uh, on the customer service side, there'll there'll be a day that 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 will be the norm. And I think that uh, the energy that some people use to resist is the same energy that that they need to use to embrace, because hating an idea will not make it go away. Okay, and so you know, again, it's it, partially by I think age demographic has, a, has, you know, kind of lines up pretty accurately with this. And I think that the next wave of people in the business is already happening. It's, um, they're already here. They're just more on the vendor and the real estate side than in the title. And we need to create an attraction inside the title business to bring that next generation into the title industry more than has happened. And some of that may be the simple advancements in technology that people can actually bring to the table or create even for the title business from within the title business. But to answer your question directly, it's uh, whether we like it or not, it's coming. And I, I just I just think it's part of the future. And I think the, the quicker we embrace it, the better off we'll all be. Yeah, and from my perspective too, as a millennial and I'm an elder millennial, so that that means anything to you. Um, basically, it means that I remember things like the sound of dial up and, you know, printer paper uh -huh. that had the, you know, like there, there's certain, you know, cultural references there that are super important that distinguish elder from younger millennials. But even though I'm an elder millennial and I'm on my way out of obviously being cool too. Um, but, <laughs> but basically I, I like to be able to have multiple options and how I engage with a company. And so for me, things like being able to get a really quick question answered with a chat bot is very appealing to me. And from that perspective too, from the consumer, that kind of leads into my next question I have and the last question I have for you, which is should title companies start looking to engage with end consumers more and sort of help position themselves and sell directly to them so that when they're having conversations with their real estate agent, they're saying, I wanna work with this title company. So let's talk about consumers. I think the internet has made every single consumer highly educated to the point where they know everything right 
And whether that's true or not, they feel like they do if they if they do some research. So I think a couple things should happen. Um, it, it, should you advertise directly to consumers? I think there is a way to do that. Most people have experimented or many people have experimented with things like billboards and things like that, that they can't direct, you know, that's a statusy thing. It's somewhat of an ego thing. And, and but they, nobody says, uh, yeah, I want you to use this title company because I saw their billboard. I shouldn't say nobody. Very rarely, I can imagine that would that would be the case. However, it does create a recognition in the marketplace that yeah, everything in marketing is about impressions, right? And so each impression does more deeply solidify somebody's ability or willingness to make a certain decision. Um, but from an advertising standpoint, I think you need to be consumer friendly. I think you need to be consumer attractive. I think you need to make your website, your social media postings, the kinds of things that would uh, catch the eye of a consumer, because those are all the impressions that we're talking about from a marketing standpoint. But from a direct uh, advertising standpoint or direct direct marketing standpoint, uh, the only time in which I look at an agency and say, or title agency and say, here's how you should market directly to a consumer is the only identifiable consumer that's going to have a relatively short-term need for a title company would be a seller. And that's where the opportunity is missed, is marketing directly to sellers whose listing goes on the market. So if you, you, know, if you wanna look at you know, 100% of all listings in this market, now 99% of all listings in this market are gonna, gonna go to escrow, they're gonna close, right? Which means those are the people that are gonna need title insurance right away and they're consumers. So maybe we talk to those people. Maybe we have an initiative where we direct mail, email, whatever to those individuals directly. Even in markets where the buyer's agent picks, it's still an influential element, right? It's a touch point for the consumer. So that gives you a little bit of uh, direct approach. But short of that, I think your dollar, I think you won't see the ROI on your dollars. I don't think the industry is at that point just yet, but I do think it is a conversation worth starting to have with people and yes. starting to think more a little bit about especially to your point about growing your share of customers. And, you know, if you have figured out a way to nail down your process and you have found a way to really engage those, I would say more prime leads and potential clients, and you're still looking to grow your market share, that's probably where you want to kind of start setting your sights. Yeah. It's like the, it's like the mastering your backyard syndrome. Mm -hmm. Or or figuring out, um, you know, your target, right? Like you've got that persona, that audience that, you know, is right, right there, bullseye in the middle that is going to be a definite potential lead and is going to be using your services repeatedly. And then you've got all these other different personas that are sort of touched within the, the real estate transaction that could also be a potential customer as well. So just yeah. think of it like that. Yep. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you so much, Daryl. Is there anything else that you want to share? There's all kinds of things I'd love to share today. I will I will tell you that uh, I'm going to go back to uh, selling on the front side and the back side of the bell curve because you took the words out of my mouth. Prop Logics is definitely a front of the bell curve company. You are very much committed to helping your customer base and your potential customer base with strategies to grow their business. And, and I was gonna say that, and then you said that, and I thought, well, gosh, I can't just say it right now. It look like, look like I'm trying to get points, but I do, I do wanna throw that out there, is that your model is what I'm talking about. So a title agency helping a, the real estate community on the front side of the bell curve to earn the business, to show them ways to improve their business so that they've earned the business on the backside is, is really prop logics in a nutshell. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for, you know, collaborating with us and helping us bring really important and valuable information to the title industry. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been fun to, to be with you today and fun to throw out our Title Sales Mastery 2021 plug for the fun of it. <laughs> yeah, did you want to say those dates and place and maybe where people can go and get oh, their certainly. tickets? Certainly, it's uh, Title Sales Mastery 2021. It's going to be in Reno, Nevada at the Atlantis Resort, 30 minutes from Tahoe. So. Uh, it's going to be fun all the way around. Um, and you can go to Title Sales Mastery 2021 and get the early bird special. I think it's $395 or something like that. They don't tell me all the information when it comes to that stuff. But um, yeah, it's something if you want to build your agency and knowing what's going to be happening 2021 part two when refis are going to look different, it's, 
you're going to need as much information as you can. It's two days, highly interactive, very motivational, but you'll leave with a complete workbook of strategies uh, filled out and completed, ready to go back into your market. So we hope to see you there. Great. Uh, well, thanks again. I really appreciate your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. And thanks for the opportunity. Sure thing. Bye, Daryl. Take care. Bye-bye. Daryl will be presenting more selling strategies during the 2021 Title Sales Mastery event in October. To learn more and to register, go to darylturner.com. That's D-A-R-R-Y-L-T-U-R-N-E-R.com. Title Talk listeners can use the promo code PropLogicsVIP2021 to save $50. Thanks again to Daryl Turner for joining me today. Title Talks is produced by PropLogix and myself. Original music is by Cole Sando. Original graphics are by Jordan Norris. Until next time, happy closings. <laughs>